O Lord, remember your mercies and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood established the Paschal mystery who lives and reigns forever and ever. reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human, so will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty and without majesty, we saw him, no looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and took no account of, of him, and we took no account of him. And yet ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies the punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly, he never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich. Though he had done no wrong and there had been no perjury in his mouth, the Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs, he shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His, whole, his soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence I will grant whole hordes for his tribute, for he, he shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death, for letting himself be taken for a sinner, while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord. Fear to my friends. Oh. 
from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who is tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learnt to obey through suffering, but having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas, the traitor, knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there, and he brought the cohort to this place, together with a detachment of guards, 
sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus then came forward and said, They answered, He said, Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you were looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken, not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized <coughs> Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter with another disciple followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter stayed outside the door. So the other <coughs> disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Are you not that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I've always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. <coughs> As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at once the cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, We are not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, I am a Jew. 
It's your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So you are a king then? Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of, of truth... Pilate said, Truth, what is that? And with that he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release one of the prisoners at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, Not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. And after this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple cloak. They kept coming up to him and saying, <coughs> King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I'm going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So in the end, over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross he went out to the skull or as it was called in Hebrew Golgotha with two others one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished,
finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one to hem. So they said to one another, Instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, the words of scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed. And to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance. And immediately, there came <coughs> This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth. And he gives it so that you may believe as well. To fulfill the words of Scripture. Not one bone of his will be broken. In another place, Scripture says, They are the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, removed <coughs> the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well to Jesus at night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. <coughs> At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was a Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask anyone at the end of the story of Jesus' life, what is Christianity about? The chances are they'll say to you it's about forgiveness and it's about love. And yet strangely, as we ponder what's just happened, 
forgiveness and love are not at the forefront because at the forefront is not the teaching of Christ but the man himself, Jesus. And as we watch this man die, as we stand looking at him, what emerges is a picture of him rather than a picture of his teaching. And the picture of him is quite astounding. It is astounding for one reason in my mind, and that is he stands in absolute contrast to every one of us in this cathedral. Well, I can say he stands in contrast to me at the very least because he is the opposite of what I am. As we watch the passion unfold from last night on Holy Thursday, we recognize one profound truth and that he in his passion, hands himself over and allows others to take control of his life. That said, if we look back over the gospel, that in fact is the story of the gospel from the moment of the baptism. From that point until this point, his whole life has not been about forgiveness and love, but I give control to another. And in that sense, this man stands in opposition to each of us. How many of us want to control our own lives? And yet we find none of that in Jesus. Something must happen to me, I wish it was over with. Does he do anything to control things so it doesn't happen? Does he do anything to try to have less pain? No, he simply enters this and allows the control of his life, of his death, to fall in the hands of others, in the trial, in the crucifixion, in everything that happens. I think this is the first thing that we stand before when we ponder the death of Jesus Christ, how he is so different to us, that said, there is a consequence of that in the way we meet him. He never tried to control another person. You get a sense that he got annoyed with his mother, but he didn't try to control her. He doesn't try to control any one of the disciples. Peter, you're going to betray me, but there you go. Judas, go now and do what you must do. At every point, he never control another person. Turn your eyes now to yourselves. I try to control my own life, and in order to do that, like all of us, we need to control other people. It's the only way to control your own life. Control your life means control somebody else. And Jesus doesn't do that. And the challenge that the death presents is, well, we're called to follow Jesus, to be like him. Do you want to control your own life? Yes. How do you do it? Without knowing it, you control others. Husbands and wives do this, children do that, everyone does it. And in that sense, on this day, I can say to all of us, including to myself, I don't stand up very well to Jesus Christ. But it's hard to hand over control. Then the answer is, do not try to control. Because what's the consequence of not controlling? You hand your life into the, into the hands of God. Only when my life is in the hands of God would it unfold well, regardless of where it goes. The truth is, I actually have no control of my life. I'd be a fool to say that I did. Then. I want my life to be controlled by God. 
None of you can control your own lives. You can't set the date of your death. You can't set anything. Then let go of trying to control. Follow Jesus. And let him, let the Lord, let God our Father control us. Give ourselves freely into the hands of God and the life we live will be fulfilled, happy and towards God. And let us stand for the intercessions. For Holy Church, let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Let us pray also for our most holy Father Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, Look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Also for our Bishop Gregory, for all bishops, priests and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, the faithful and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, <coughs> that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. 
Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first chose for your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may, may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of your good works done by those who believe in you. In gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, Look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us and throughout the whole world. The prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all <coughs> errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in the hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
the veneration, you can venerate by bowing on the other side of the altar rails. You can continue. May God have mercy on us and bless us. May he let his face shed its light upon us and have mercy on us.
because I led thee through this desert forty years and fed thee with manna and brought thee into a land exceeding good. Thou hast prepared a cross for thy Savior.
peace tank. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. <coughs> as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Say the word, and my soul shall be.
and let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Bow down for the blessing. O Lord, may abundant blessing descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be secure through Christ our Lord. Amen.